My name is Richard T. Scott. I'm a classical painter gone rogue. Now, I'm leaving the studio to search for artists who color outside the lines. I'll be your guide on this odyssey to answer the eternal question, what is art? When I think of artists who stretch our minds, I can think of no better example than Roxanne Jackson. Roxanne's work is impossible to stuff into a box and label. The lines between the functional and fine art, the highbrow and lowbrow, traditional ideas of beauty and ugliness, these boundaries aren't so much broken as shattered. She's extremely skillful in her use of traditional materials, yet irreverent in her aesthetic and choice of subject. Gracefully formed amphoras in bold colors, ornamented with all manner of absurdities as if manifested from a psychedelic vision. A gold tooth, a witch finger, an impudent monkey brandishing bulbous rosy butt cheeks. Her sculptures, the head of Medusa, a beheaded unicorn. The forms she conjures into being are many things at once. They're kitschy and playful, yet the specter of death is never far. Perhaps drawing on her Mayan ancestry or her fascination with sci-fi and horror, she treats the subject at once with levity and gravitas. Her work is anything but conventional. Thank you so much for having us over in your studio, Roxanne. I've been admiring your work for quite a while. Thank you so much for coming. I feel excited that you reached out to me. I'm seeing that your work has gone in a more playful direction, more irreverent. A lot of your work seems to be about breaking down the barriers between forms and genres. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that direction you've gone. When I was in graduate school, my work was very, very visually intense. Like there was maybe, maybe it was devoid of humor. Mm -hmm. And one of my peers said, Roxanne, I don't, I'm confused when I walk into your studio because it's just like really dark figures that look like they've been burnt with intestines and like lots of references to blood and gore. It was maybe a little too intense. Yeah, and yeah. he was like, but your personality is not really like that. And that's just where I was at the time in my life because a lot of very traumatic things had happened leading up to that point. I knew that I couldn't make work beyond where I was at, like spiritually and emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew that it would evolve and like become more lighthearted. There's more levity now, there's more yes. humor. Yeah. I do think that's a big part of like really my refreshing. personality. Yeah. I think humor is important and it should be an art. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to just reference a ceramic technique that's already been referenced a hundred times. I want there to be levity and, and something else special to it. So part of the polarities I'm talking about with my work, like, um, you know, you, you see the irreverent side, there's also a reverent side because yes. if I didn't care, I wouldn't even make it in the first place. Right, right. But also humor, humor balances some of the more intense things that happen in the work. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of it Makes it more palatable. I think so. Yeah, accessible. Yeah. yeah. You have a background in botany. Yes, and, and I ended up getting a studio art minor. How did that happen? Well, I was a river guide for a long time and, you know, taught snowboarding, so I had this kind of lifestyle going into undergrad and then during undergrad and then after. And basically, long story short, my brother died very suddenly, a uh, very tragic death, and then also I had started seeing people drown on rivers. And I was on a trip where that happened, and that was really intense for me. And the approximation of these two deaths was really close. Yeah. So I just had this epiphany that life is short, of course. Yeah. I knew this, and that I always knew that I would be an artist, because my dad did lots of art with me and was a, you know, like a Sunday painter, but he mm -hmm. made lots of weird stuff. He always assumed that I would just be an artist, as yeah. did the rest of my family. And I did that too. But. When I went to undergrad, for some reason, I just felt like it, it seemed more safe to me to study yeah. science. So the art came much later, after pressure from my dad, actually. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, I have to do this now. I have to pursue this thing that was on the back burner, but it was art. But it was always something that I knew that I would get to it. I would do it in time because it was always there with me. And so mm. I just made a decision. I'm just going to figure out how to do this. And so I um, made plans and worked for a couple years to build up a portfolio to get mm -hmm. into graduate school. Where did you go to grad school? I went to graduate school at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Okay. Which at the time I was like, what? Where? The Midwest, huh? They have That's a good so ceramics flat. program. But they do have a very yeah. good ceramics program. And I had met one of um, the professors at the time, Gail Kendall, who mm -hmm. since has retired. Um, because I used to have a studio, Anderson Ranch Art Center in Snowmass mm -hmm. Village, because I used to teach snowboarding. So I was making ceramics there, and uh, I met Gail, and she was kind of an advocate for me to get into grad school. And then so after that, you moved to New York? So after I finished that program, I got a residency in Portland, Oregon, at the Oregon College Art and Craft, which has closed since. Mm -hmm. So after grad school, I moved to Portland, and I lived there for some years. And then I moved to Minneapolis, lived there for a couple years, and then I did a long-term residency in Berlin, and then I made my way to New York. I saw also that you did a residency in Japan for a bit. I did. That yeah. was in 2019. 2019. That was amazing. Okay. Yes, I loved that. Do you find that your work is viewed differently in, say, Japan or in Europe rather than in the United States? Yeah, absolutely, because everyone has their own association with ceramics and, and with the imagery that I use. So, mm -hmm. you know, in Europe in general, ceramics is really prevalent there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all these museums dedicated to craft, and there's like a big love for ceramics. But also, ceramics is really um, admired in Japan, because mm -hmm. that's where the first tea ceremony was, and, you know, basically invented in Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural Park. So, it's interesting to see, like, in Europe, I think of it as porcelain, you know, Delftware, like the fake porcelain, blue and mm -hmm. white, and the kind of kitschy, figurative works. And in Japan, there's a lot of different influences, but, you know, Raku, Onigama mm -hmm. firings, mm -hmm. like, clay bodies that are a lot more experimental. Honestly, some of the best ceramic artists that I'm really excited about their work are Japanese. But um, when I was at this residency program, yeah, people responded to my work very positively, but I could tell that they were very into how I made objects mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. craft and quality is so important there. Yes, and I yes. feel like once they kind of saw how I made things or even how I packed work to ship, yeah, I felt like, oh, okay, I think I'm getting some nods of approval here, which meant a lot to me. One of the things I find so fascinating about your work, the layers of glazes, they give me this sense of archeological time, this vastness. And yet at the same time, your subject matter is very of the moment. When I'm looking at your Medusa here, which I love, it reminds me of the story of Medusa. As you are familiar, was raped by Poseidon. And then as the victim, she was punished. And she was turned into a Gorgon. So she was punished for being beautiful and being forced through trauma, you know? And that seems uh, extremely relevant to us today. When I made this piece, when I was sculpting her, it was um, getting ready for the recent election and I was having a lot of anxiety about that. And so that's why I was like, this piece needs to be very gory and very bloody. Yeah. And I didn't glaze it until months after the election. It is very pertinent now. One of the things about mythology and these stories is to see how they can relate to our current times mm -hmm. and they are they keep being adapted in different ways like lots of cultures speak about Medusa or have some kind of reference to a female figure with snakes yes. or snakes for hair yeah. and uh, one thing that this piece is doing when Perseus was flying over the desert with Medusa's decapitated head, right. her blood when it hit the sand manifested into venomous snakes. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's happening here. And I'm also, yeah. I'm really into sci-fi horror oh, and cool. John Carpenter's The Thing, especially mm -hmm. the original one from, I think, 1989. The Thing, the blood had consciousness, that alien form had consciousness yeah. even at the cellular level of blood. Mm -hmm. So it was a shapeshifter and could manifest into anything. So I feel like maybe he was referencing the Medusa mythology with that story oh, and that film. So this yeah. is kind of showing that snakes are morphing from her blood. Could you tell me 
a little bit about your choices of glazes in this piece? And there's never like one glaze on anything. Mm -hmm. There's alchemy that happens with ceramics. So this is lots of glazes. And this piece has been fired multiple times, which is something that I do with almost every piece, is I fire something repeatedly, mm -hmm. sometimes up to eight or nine times, and sometimes varying the temperature each firing, a technique called damp firing. So you mm -hmm. fire at a high temperature with one glaze and then put lower temperature glaze on fire it again. This is three glazes on her skin, and then they're reacting with the luster. And there are three glazes that are applied, and they're not applied uniformly. So they're applied erratically to get this surface that looks somewhat stone-like. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you looked at Medusa, if you looked at her in the eye, you would turn into stone. So right. I wanted her skin to actually reference the stone. When you get a chance to look at these up close, it really comes through. There's iridescence on this blood, which is really beautiful. The layers of glazes, in many ways, they feel very biological and oftentimes botanical and geological. There's so many different individual expressions that you've been able to attain with your glazes. You have a lot of uh, split heads. Is there an intuitive kind of thought behind that? When the forms I'm making are more sculptural, the process that I build with them is like I build things solid, and then when they get to a certain firmness, I hollow them out section mm -hmm. by section. So every element of this is hollow. Mm -hmm. And that process means I'm cutting pieces. And I was for years always seeing these flat planes or these flat edges from cutting a section. And one day I just paid attention to that process mm -hmm. and kept it. So that was one reason that I started doing these splayed heads. And I think that's really interesting because the process also informs the imagery. And that is yeah. something that I have learned, you know, that I, it keeps surprising me and just the process itself teaches me, so it's this like circular effect. Yes, um, yeah. And then also, when, when I do something that's a split head, to me, it's implying that the piece is changing and evolving. And I think of everything as a shapeshifter because mm -hmm. the universe is constantly changing and constantly expanding. Mm. And the only truth in the universal law is change and transformation. So a leaf obviously turns brown and changes with the seasons. We are also changing because we are also aging. Yes. The rocks are changing, so everything is a shape shifter, mm -hmm. just at different rates. So to me, the split head is alluding to um, a form that's kind of turning in on itself, and it is alluding to that transformation, which is a metaphor for many things, including mm -hmm. aging, including death, you know, whatever, however you want to see that. So I see it as like a moment in time mm -hmm. captured, which also is happening with the glaze, because glaze, when it gets to temperature in the kiln, is actually melting like molten lava in the kiln. And then the kiln stops going up and cools. So the process of ceramics is like igneous rock. So I also think about this blood mm. was actually melting in the kiln at one point in time. And I'm capturing it as it cools and freezes. So to me, that also makes sense with a split head, being fr a, a thing that's being frozen in time. Like the process mimics geology, but the form itself mimics geology. Like a geode or some kind of rock that's petrifying and changing over time. So yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I really feel that your choice of materials is communicating much of your concept as well. Like it's all seamlessly fitting together. Even among fantastic artists, it's that's kind of a rare thing. Like the form is and the function are all, all kind of seamlessly expressing harmonically the same thing. So it's really cool to see how you develop this. If you had some advice to give to yourself when you were an aspiring artist, what would that be? It's a very personal thing, you know, and I feel like some of the most important um, movements that I've made for myself is when I don't think about the details, mm -hmm. the details such as where am I going to show this work or what gallery or how much is this going to sell. Of course, to a certain degree, I do have to think about those. Mm -hmm. But when I stopped focusing on that, and when I started just putting most of my energy as much as possible into the actual practice of making, the studio practice, the making of objects, as soon as I put actually most of my energy and intention in that space, that's when the most has happened for me. That's when I've yeah. been like really, really rewarded. Basically, I think about it like this. I love making things with clay. Mm -hmm. I love glazing. Mm -hmm. I love the alchemy that happens with ceramics and the process of firing in the kiln, I love pulling stuff out when I never know how it's gonna look. Even though I might do so many test tiles for a piece, I still never know. I love this unpredictable process that is very much tied into the ceramic material. 
And when I can just spend most of my energy in this space of curiosity, then I know it's, it's all going to work out. It's like success yeah. is the byproduct. It's not the goal. Just focus on like why I'm an artist in the first place or when I was a kid, why I was doing drawings at four years old. So that's what I'm trying to cultivate. And that's what I would say. Like, it's easy to get distracted by all the other things, yes. but yeah. keep it pure, you know, keep it simple and trust. That is so well said. You know, in the major arcana of the tarot, the high priestess, she emerges when the veil between you and the underworld is thinnest. Roxanne is like the high priestess. She opens the doorway between the conscious and the subconscious. At first, you know, we might fear the knowledge of our own mortality, but I think we learn to more deeply appreciate each moment we have. Roxanne's work is most a celebration of life and creation. Many of her creations have some element of the anthropomorphic, writhing somewhere between human and beast and functional object. But peering through the layers of glazes, you get a sense of archaeological expanse of time. She somehow makes one of humanity's oldest art forms feel shockingly relevant and now, and demanding, embodying, a destruction of the forces that constrict us.